thank you for that introduction and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. In Christianity and Social Order, William Temple argues that there is an authentic tradition of Christian social teaching, but like other parts of the Christian tradition, he says, it is a living thing, proving its vitality in the only way in which that can be done, by showing a capacity to relate itself effectively to changing conditions and circumstances. It's that blend of continuity and change that I want to try and address today. In Christianity and Social Order, Temple was chiefly concerned with how theological principles translate into social policy, but also whether traditional teachings had to adapt and evolve in the light of social change or new insights of non-theological knowledge. 80 years on today, the gulf between church and society, theological and non-theological or secular knowledge has grown and arguably nowhere more so than that between public opinion and the official teaching of the church around gender identity, gender roles and relationships, including acceptance of same-sex relationships, although recent evidence suggests that this gulf is narrowing. My aim in this paper today, then, is not so much to evaluate Temple's views on these matters, but rather to ask whether we can learn anything from his theological method and his approach to Christian social ethics about how to address these questions in a way that is theologically serious, mindful of cultural change, and yet still capable of contributing constructively to society. And at this point, I want to interpose a timeline indicating some of the key economic, legal, and cultural changes that have taken place over the last 80 years. And this is simply to highlight how much has changed since Temple's day. And embedded in this timeline are three key strands. Firstly, the role of women in the economy and society. Secondly, issues of gender identity and a move essentially from a fairly binary understanding of sex and gender to understandings of multiple and non-binary gender identities. And then changes in attitude and legislation towards marriage, relationships and sexuality. When he writes about the family in Christian social order, Temple probably assumes that the traditional Western mid 20th century pattern of the nuclear family with the man as the main breadwinner would continue to be the norm. That's certainly, I think, the assumption behind his contemporary William Beveridge in his report of 1942. But of course, the massive influx of women into the workforce during 1939-45 was not reversed post-war. And indeed, one of the factors behind that was the growth of the welfare state itself as an employer of women. And that's indicated on my timeline by the formation of the NHS in 1948, down there on the bottom left. In turn, women's greater economic freedom prompted changes in legislation and cultural attitudes, such as the Equal Pay Act of 1970 and the Sex Discrimination Act of 1975, from which, of course, as you will all know, religious bodies were exempt. The contraceptive pill, which began to be available 20 years after Christianity and social order in the early 60s, and changes in patterns of childbearing and child rearing, created a revolution in family patterns and reproductive choices from the 1960s. In turn, these changes began to alter the assumption that marriage was the sole context for sexual relationships and child rearing, so that by 2010, a similar proportion of cohabiting parents as married parents cared for dependent children, 38% and 39% respectively. In terms of the role of women in the Church of England, Temple was already considering the question of the ordination of women as early as 1916, although he was concerned about the possible impact on church unity and ecumenical relations. But 50 years separates Christianity and social order from the general synod vote to ordain women as priests, and over 70 years to the consecration of the first within bishop. So some of you may have to go away and have a little lie down at that news, a huge gulf of time. The first recorded surgical procedures for those wishing to change gender identity, people have called transsexuals in those days, dates from the early 1950s. And throughout the second half of the 20th century, social scientists challenged biological and essentialist notions of gender, initially by drawing a distinction between biological sex and socially constructed or culturally mediated gender and the identity of women and men. 
But more recently, we've seen a shift beyond binary notions of sex and gender, masculine and feminine, towards a greater proliferation of gender identities, focusing less on assigned definitions and more on subjective and lived experience. So again, our understandings of gender identity over these 80 years have moved from binary differentiation to multiple and non-binary and transgender identities. This greater diversity and fluidity was reflected, for example, in the 2010 equality and diversity legislation, which identified a range of protected personal characteristics, including gender reassignment, sexual identity and gender, as well, of course, as religion and belief. And in issues of sexuality, marriage and relationships, it's worth noting that it was 15 years after the publication of Christianity and Social Order that the Wolfenden Committee recommended that homosexual acts between consenting males over 21 be decriminalised, and a further 10 years after that, in 1967, so a whole quarter century after Christianity and Social Order, before it passed into law as the Sexual Offences Act. And since then, there's been a further liberalisation of attitudes towards same-sex relationships, reflected in legislation such as the 2004 Civil Partnerships Act and the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Act of 2013. But of course, once again, one of the institutions that is exempt is the Church of England. But overall then, looking at this timeline, we need to be aware that any process of theological discernment about these issues of sex, gender, marriage and relationships takes place in the context of rapidly changing social trends and an increasing complexity and diversity of lifestyles. As Living in Love and Faith, published in 2020, which is right to the right of your timeline, observes, the Church of England's deliberations about identity, sexuality, relationships and marriage don't happen in isolation, but alongside and entangled with the conversations of many other religious and non-religious communities. Amidst these massive social and cultural changes, it seems to me the church is still asking questions that would have been familiar to William Temple and which he asks in Christianity and Social Order. How does the church speak or intervene in society? What values should it be upholding? How does it communicate its core convictions to a wider public? In Christianity and Social Order, Temple argues that the church can justify its interference in matters of state on the grounds that nothing falls beyond the scope of God. Temple's sacramental and incarnational theology and his Hegelian idea of God's providential presence in history impels him to listen and respond to changing circumstances and to be respectful of secular wisdom and new discoveries in scientific understanding. Alan Sugate, another great scholar of Temple, of course, characterizes this approach to social ethics as dialectical, it was informed, he says, by a continual interplay of scripture, tradition, and grounded in experience of faith and life, in a union of reflection and action. At any point in time, we are to use our current understanding of faith and life to interpret our concrete experience of living, and we are to allow particular experience to modify that theological understanding. Hence, Temple's advocacy of what others termed middle axioms, which attempt to chart a course between general principles and detailed directives, between theologically derived values and concrete policies. Middle axioms, I think, also serve as a kind of interim ethic and therefore serve as a reflection of Temple's Christian realism, which recognises that in a fallen and imperfect world, no practical policy will ever fully embody the entirety of God's kingdom. So again, middle axioms serve to mediate between church and world, this world and the next, between traditional teachings and concrete policies. It's worth noting, I think, also that Temple placed a great emphasis on natural law, which he defined as the proper function of a human activity as apprehended by a consideration of its own nature. But especially when we're thinking about issues of gender and sexuality, we shouldn't, I think, interpret Temple's understanding of natural law as referring to some kind of biological reductionism. As several contemporary commentators have noted, I think we should hear this much more as a kind of virtue ethic in which the ends or telos of human life are derived from the purposes of God as active in history. Hence, Temple conceives freedom as liberty to realize one's highest potential, as someone made in the image of God, 
and invites his readers to rethink personhood as relational rather than absolute or isolated, since that realization of self-fulfillment is always social rather than purely individualistic. And of course, later in Christianity and social order, Temple sets out that vision of human flourishing as necessarily facilitated by social institutions such as education, work, family, and voluntary associations. This question of how to adjudicate between the wisdom of faith and new and changing contexts and how to discern the word of God amidst theological and non-theological voices is nowhere more acutely experienced than in the Church of England's debates around issues of gender and sexuality. As Living in Love and Faith, published in 2020, puts it, how are Christians to discern what is co compatible and what is incompatible with the life of Christ's body? How are we to discern what is holy, what embodies and communicates the loving kindness of God? In Temple's work, we can see a characteristically Anglican triangulation between scripture, tradition, and reason as sources for the theological understanding. But tradition was to be interpreted with the aid of conscience, and revelation was required to vindicate its claim at the bar of reason and conscience. Now, in some traditions, a fourth element is added, that of experience. In some instances, this is conceived as the inward and intimate apprehension of one's relationship to God, such as 18th century pietism. It can also be taken as the narrative of God's grace at work autobiographically, or as a critical category by which established canons and authorities are challenged by those who are marginalized and excluded from official teachings. That third emphasis on theologies constructed from the underside of history and the idea of the preferential option for the poor as a central hermeneutic has formed a powerful and influential sensibility for theological methods since the last quarter of the 20th century. Drawing on experiential and inductive pedagogy, pedagogies, conventional hierarchies of expertise are reversed in that professional educators, theologians, and religious leaders come to regard their role as facilitating and learning from the poor. But despite Temple's insistence that the church should listen to non-theological voices, his notion of what that might mean was really confined to a fairly elitist model of expertise. I think perhaps of the interdisciplinary gatherings of intellectuals and the governing classes through groups like the moot between the wars. But by the beginning of this century, it was starting to be accepted that any church deliberations couldn't take place without listening to these personal experiences and particularly to the perspectives and stories of those most affected by virtue of being excluded or marginalized. And this principle does begin to seep into church deliberations on gender and sexuality, but it does take time. Issues in human sexuality issued in 1991 draws on scripture and tradition, but is notable for its absence of any non-theological scientific or social scientific data and its lack of any first-hand testimonies from anyone openly identifying as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, queer, or intersex. Subsequently, however, the church moved to a correct that omission. So with some issues in, in human sexuality published in 2003, and with the initiation of the so-called shared conversations in 2017, church deliberations on issues of gender, sexuality, and relationships have been increasingly mindful of the principle, don't talk about us without us. The most recent phase of those discussions, Living in Love and Faith, which began in 2020, is acutely aware, to its credit, I think, of the importance of incorporating a diversity of voices, speaking from a variety of marital, gendered, and family arrangements in people's own words. In asking itself that perennial question of how to bring tradition into dialogue with contemporary context, it acknowledges that what Temple called the conception of a governing divine spirit, which is in all the world, might actually indwell the lives and lifestyles of ordinary Christians, including LGBTQI people. What else can we learn about how the church might engage constructively with wider society in thinking about the nature of marriage and the ethics of personal identity? Returning to Christianity and social order, I wonder whether those three great themes that run throughout his discussion as the personal and social ends towards human flourishing might be directed, freedom, fellowship, and service, 
might in some way come back into play as helpful benchmarks for us today. Two recent contributions to the debates about same-sex relationships attempt something of this nature. Susanna Cornwall looks for a way beyond the polarization of the debate about gender and sexuality within the Anglican Church, and particularly around the impasse around differing interpretations of scripture. She suggests that a more constructive way forward might be to develop some new concepts of the goods inherent in marriage of whatever gender. So again, more of a turn to virtue ethics than purely focusing on scriptural interpretation. Susanna Cornwall says this, emerging questions in sexuality and sexual ethics and in gender, including the rise of non-binary identity, may prompt liberals and conservatives alike to step well beyond their comfort zones and reconsider what are the goods that Christians should endorse. In this way, they may discover that despite their disagreements, they are closer together on broader concerns such as faithfulness, stability, and permanence than they might previously have suspected. She continues, if there are to be goods in sexual ethics on which Christians can agree, let us ask which institutions, behaviors, and theologies actually best uphold them. In other words, reminiscent, I think, of Temple's convictions that the church deliberates on matters of human and social life, not simply to get its own house in order, but as a gift to a more constructive and humane social order. Similarly, following the consultations between the Church of England and the Cameron government in 2012 on the introduction of civil marriage for same-sex couples, Jill Henwood carried out a series of extended interviews with a range of Christian couples, same-sex and different sex. Based on their lived experience and first-hand perspectives, Henwood considered the prospects for a Christian doctrine of what she terms equal marriage, or equal access to marriage and equality within marriage, regardless of sexual orientation. She argues that Christian ethics around marriage have been dominated by a teleology of procreation. Yet in the 21st century, moral choices are open to so many factors that it's no longer possible to speak of a single normative framework by which family, marriage, and sexuality might be guided. Taken for granted, concepts of parenting, family structure, and reproduction have been transformed. And perhaps Christian social ethics needs to be more open to a whole range of new horizons. So Henwood chooses to rework the three traditional pillars of marriage of mutuality, fidelity, and procreation as cited by the Church of England's response to the Civil Partnerships Bill. The first two, she says, are evident in same-sex relationships as well as different sex relationships, as her interviewees affirm mutuality and fidelity. But it's around the third principle where contemporary scientific data and personal testimony may prove critical. She therefore proposes mutuality, fidelity, and pro-slash creation, pro-oblique creation, which she argues is a principle of generativity that goes beyond biological reproduction again, alone. So like Susanna Cornwall, Jill Henwood advances a set of interim proposals, rather like middle axioms, which emerge recognizably from Christian tradition, tradition take account of a diversity of lived experience, but which can also serve as shared goods around which mutual and inclusive dialogue can converge. I've been asking whether Temple's approach to Christian social ethics in Christianity and social order are relevant or at all helpful for us today. The first important thing is that Temple insists on listening to non-theological sources and voices on theological grounds. He defends that on theological grounds. Similarly, his attachment to natural law and to a concept of common grace informs his commitment to seeking out common ground with others through a process of mediating core principles that can be widely and accessibly translated and mediated into public discourse. For Temple, it follows that the church has a mission to help create and preserve these kinds of civilized spaces of discourse in pursuit of its vocation to nurture good citizens and build a just and sustainable society. But the past 80 years have also taught us the importance of listening to a range of grassroots everyday voices 
the voices of lived experience in a spirit of greater inclusivity when it comes to theological discernment and public discourse. I think Temple would have endorsed this continuing quest to reimagine our notions of whose voices matter and where, in our times, the Spirit of God is at work in human affairs. Thank you.